Firstly, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to this webinar on how to get started in ultrasound guided injections. I'm Andy Thomas and I'm director at PhysiQuip and we distribute the Alpinian MSK diagnostic ultrasound systems and ultrasound guided injections has been a hot topic at the moment. So I'm really looking forward to, to listening to this session. We've got two great speakers, so I'm really looking forward to this. So we've, we've got over 500 people registered already for this. So big thank you for all for joining. And as we have got so many, if you could just leave your cameras off, that will help to identify the speakers and making sure that everything is streaming correctly. And also if you could just leave your microphone on mute as well, that'll avoid any background noise. If you do have any questions, please type it in the comments section on the right hand side and we'll do our very best to get around to that. So our guests, firstly, we've got Chris Myers. He's clinical director at Complete Physio and co-faculty lead for the Sports Medicine Ultrasound Group. Chris has been carrying out ultrasound gathered injections for over 10 years and performs over 500 gathered injections a year. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, Andy. Pleasure. Then we have Dr. Lorenzo Maschi. He is a specialist sports and MSK doctor who's worked for various elite sporting institutions he has also developed an online ultrasound guided injection course and is a recognized worldwide expert in ultrasound guided interventions. Thank you very much for joining us, Lorenzo. Thanks, Andy. So first off, both Chris and Lorenzo are going to share some slides for us. So I'm gonna pass straight over to Lorenzo and um, he can go straight into his. So Andy, thanks for inviting me. Uh, appreciate the invite. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly talk about uh, how I use ultrasound to direct my injections and also um, discuss some of the evidence behind ultrasound guided injections uh, and the advantages and disadvantages. And then we'll move on to Chris, who will then discuss, if you're interested in ultrasound guided interventions, how you develop uh, the skill in, um, in this, uh, or developing the skill uh, in the context of, of, of who you are. So as Andy was saying, I'm a sports and exercise medicine consultant. I train in Australia, but I've been living in London for over 30 years. And I actually started using ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions about 30 years ago when I moved to the UK. And I did it the hard way. I started from scratch and really learned from the ground up. I work in private practice. So I also work in the NHS and the military. I work in elite sport. And I use ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions together. Uh, and that's the key for me is using it together to help people. Um, and you as a practitioner, if you're thinking about doing ultrasound, ultrasound guided interventions, uh, you need to think about whether you use it for point of care ultrasound diagnostically or whether you use it for interventions or both. And I tend to use it for both. So today we're going to uh, specifically uh, restrict it to injection therapy rather than looking at the point of care ultrasound, but there's always an overlap between the two. So... Uh... I'm not, uh, there we go, into that. Right, so as an SEM practitioner, um, I always like starting off with this slide because I think when we talk about injections, we always talk about treatment. And I think you know, rehab really uh, trumps everything. Uh, and this is the way I explain to patients is that injections are always an adjunct. They're like the icing of the cake. So when we think about injections, we always think about the icing. If the sponge of the cake isn't good, then the icing it doesn't matter what the icing tastes like, the cake is not gonna taste good. So it's really important that you emphasize rehab and injections are always the extra uh, on top of that. So I always get asked this question. So this is uh, actually this, Chris comes from your, um, your video. So this is a, an example of an ultrasound guided knee joint injection. I think it was done by you, Chris, was it? I think it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I hope, I hope so it goes to the joint. This is, this is a simple knee joint injection. So this is what we call an in-plane axial approach. So you can see here, this is the skin, you've got the subcutaneous tissue, you've got the quadriceps tendon, and then here is the knee joint, knee joint being between the quadriceps tendon and prefemoral fat pads. This is superior or what we call the supralateral approach. And you can see, you can, you know, in, in some cases you can use a 25 gauge one inch needle to uh, inject the knee joint depending on the patient. And these injections should be pain-free. So if you do the knee injection properly, it should be pain-free. So this is what ultrasound provides. It provides visualization. That's the most important thing, but also it can provide some clinical reasoning. 
uh, so it can make you decide whether you go ahead or not go ahead with the injection. So I get asked, asked this question all the time. What is the evidence? What is the evidence to suggest that someone should be doing ultrasound guided interventions? Well, these are the key papers. First paper is American Medical Society who released a position statement about five years ago. There's also this interesting uh, narrative review that was published a couple of years ago that surmises the evidence quite nicely. And then this systematic review and mirror analysis published by the uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine about five years ago. So what it says is there is increased evidence or, or very good evidence suggests that ultrasound guided is more accurate than landmark guided injections and equal to accuracy for fluoroscopic guided injections. And that includes small joints, large joints, uh, and, and it includes various practitioners, so physiotherapists uh, to orthopedic surgeons. So mm -hmm. evidence of accuracy. But more importantly, is there evidence of effectiveness? Well, there's less evidence here, but I would see it as more evolving evidence. Uh, there's some really good papers that were published about eight years ago by a group in New Mexico, America. They looked at osteoarthritis and inflammatory arthropathy of the knee, and they found there was very good evidence suggests that ultrasound guided injection reduces pain uh, and uh, reduces cost uh, when compared to ultrasound guided interventions. There's also this systematic review that was published by the British Journal of Sports Medicine that showed that ultrasound guided injections are more accurate and more effective, particularly in the short term, for various shoulder joint injections, uh, some cranial injections, uh, long head and biceps tendon injections. The caveat here is that the effectiveness was only short lived, apart from the long head and biceps injection, which had a medium term effect. There's also some evidence of cost effectiveness. So I mentioned that, that group in New Mexico, uh, there was a 23% reduction in cost per patient who had a knee joint injection performed under ultrasound guidance. This might be related to the fact that the injections were more accurate and more effective. But there was also a study published about five years ago on comparing ultrasound guided to fluoroscopic guided injections and finding there was about a 25% reduction in cost when you compare the two, but the accuracy is the same. So certainly there is definite evidence for accuracy some evidence for effectiveness and also some evidence for cost effectiveness. For me personally, I think there's some evolving evidence for use, for use uh, of ultrasound guidance uh, in practice. What are the other advantages of using ultrasound? I think my, one of the, the more important advantages is, is that you can combine the point of care ultrasound with the ultrasound guided intervention. That is producing a one-stop shop, which is what I do in private practice as well as in the NHS and the military and also in elite sport. So these are the traditional MSK pathways in the United Kingdom at the moment. Referring practitioner refers on to an MSK practitioner who could be a physiotherapist or surgeon. They do an assessment. They then refer on to a radiologist to do further imaging. The radiologist does an ultrasound then refers back to the MSK practitioner. The MSK practitioner assesses the ultrasound, decides they need an injection. Patient goes back to the radiologist, has the injection. Patient then is referred back to the MSK practitioner. An MSK practitioner refers the patient on for further uh, exercise therapy, dietary surgery. So, you know, this whole process in the NHS, and certainly where I worked in the NHS, can take up to six months from the time that you see the patient to the time wow. you refer them on for physiotherapy, dietary surgery. So using point of care ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections, you can do a one-stop shop where the referring practitioner refers to the MSK practitioner who then does an assessment, maybe an ultrasound plus or minus injection therapy, and then refers the patient on for further treatment. So that all can be done in one consultation. You know, there's a little bit of a time limit there, but certainly in the NHS particularly, that saves a lot of time and as a result, saves costs. So what, what is the evidence of one-stop clinics? Well, actually, there are a few papers published on one-stop shops. This is a, pub, a paper published by a colleague of mine, James Brown, who's a sports and exercise medicine consultant, eminent sports consultant in Leeds, who published a paper on the one-stop shop, and they saw over 1,000 patients in their clinic. They did uh, over 600 ultrasounds and over 300 ultrasound guided injections, and they estimated they were saving um, significant cost as a result of 
uh, reduction in review appointments. There's also this interesting study by surgeons, and this is a surgeon operated ultrasonography in one stop shoulder clinic. And they found in their clinic, they saved approximately 200 pounds per patient and about 70,000 pounds uh, for their uh, clinic per year. And there's lots of debate among the surgical world, certainly about uh, whether you should be using ultrasound uh, as a one-stop shop, particularly for shoulder pathology. And it was an interesting paper here on looking at, you know, some of these concepts, uh, um, perhaps ultrasound can supersede uh, the use of magnetic resonance imaging, particularly when looking at rotator cuff pathology. But what are the other uh, uh, advantages? Well, certainly we mentioned uh, time and cost. Uh, patients actually prefer ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions. Uh, there was a study comparing um, ultrasound guided to fluoroscopic guided interventions for hip arthroscopy with 98% of patients preferring ultrasound guidance, which makes sense. The other advantage of using ultrasound guidance is it can be diagnostic. So if you inject a, a particular structure, say subacromial bursa, and the patient doesn't get better, and you know you've injected it with ultrasound, then that might add to the diagnostic uh, ability or the clinical reasoning. Patients don't get better than you're thinking about other pathologies. You know, do they have blood and urine joint pathology? Is it ease of capsulitis, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of the disadvantages of using ultrasound? Certainly, initial cost in access, and this is really the biggest bugbear for people learning ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions is, is, the, is the cost and the access to the machine. There's a huge learning curve, lots of barriers to learning, and hopefully, we'll, we'll discuss some of those barriers today and how to overcome those barriers. But some of these barriers are cost related, some of them are politi political, um, but, but certainly, with lots of barriers. The other problem with ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions, it adds to time and complexity. So, you know, in, in, in clinics where I don't have ultrasound, I don't do ultrasound guided injections, the clinics are faster and easier to run. Uh, but when I add in ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions, it becomes a lot more complex. So how do you develop ultrasound guided injection skills? In my opinion, if you're a, a young uh, SEM, consultant, registrar, physiotherapist. My view is if you're interested in doing it, you start early. Practice, practice, practice is the key. Consider access or buying machine. I think that's really important. Um, consider courses. And I think you need to pick your course depending upon whether you're a doctor or physiotherapist. Certainly if you're a doctor, you've got some advantages because you know the pharmacology, you've probably done some landmark guided injections. So it's easier for you to progress to learning a more complex skill, whereas if you're a physiotherapist, it takes a lot longer. And I think to learn ultrasound and ultrasound guided interventions, mentoring is best. And really this is the right limiting step for most people is how do you get that mentoring? And I set up a practice in, in the NHS, unfortunately it's put on hold. I'm looking at other uh, potential avenues, but put on hold at the moment where I had an SEM uh, registrar who sat in with me and I'm, I'm sure he'd be fine with me saying this, but his skills uh, grew exponentially by that supervision, by that mentoring process. Watching someone do the uh, uh, injection, uh, critiquing them, reflecting on them and repeating the injection. So I think we can discuss you know, how, if you're interested in doing ultrasound, how you would potentially go about, about doing that. You can do that through weekend courses. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked with Chris for a number of years, helping him teach lots of practitioners, both doctors, physiotherapists, weekend courses. I've done an online course with Sonos Schools, and that can be accessed through 123 Sonography, where we look at some of the theoretical aspects of doing ultrasound guided injections, or there are, you know, more advanced courses, postgraduate courses. Chris, you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that um, right now. Is that the end of it, uh, Lorenzo? So I'll, I'll stop that. Do you want me to go straight on, Andy, or do you want to do a piece of your... Chris, yeah, you go for it, yeah. Okay, can you see my cursor? Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah, well, thanks, Andy, for organising this. Um, uh, I've actually quite enjoyed putting these slides together because probably twice a week I get an email and it's probably three or four actually since uh, the lockdown of people being interested in carrying out ultrasound guided injections. So I've put this presentation together instead of me now 
emailing people and everything. I'm just going to chuck this presentation on an email and put it on, put it on the website. And hopefully this goes some way to answering a lot of the questions I get every week. What course should I do? How long does it take? Et cetera, et cetera. So I put quite a few slides together. I'll try not to go on for too long. So there's lots of opportunity for questions at the end, but this is my opinion on the current framework in the UK. Um, but I'm sure there's principles that can be taken out to other countries for learning ultrasound guided injections uh, as, as it stands. So, so we're just going to, as a, we're going to talk a bit of a little bit about learning pathways, what skills it actually requires to carry out an ultrasound guided injection. Um, look at my own personal pathway, because I know there's lots of physios on this call. Um, and so I think it's, it's good to see how I've done it. I'm not saying that's the right way or the only way, um, but certainly it's one way of organizing your own learning pathway. So I'm extended scope physiotherapist, musculoskeletal sonographer, um, and independent prescriber. Um, and I think one of the key things with ultrasound guided injections is how many you do. So I will do over 500 guided injections a year. And I believe you need to be doing hundreds of injections every year to not just maintain your competency, but actually to, to maintain your proficiency at carrying out these injections. My interest in guided injections um, has been increased recently because I've set up what is the first postgraduate certificate in ultrasound guided injections at the University of East London with Pete Restagini. And for many years, I've also been running the two day cadaveric, cadaveric course uh, that we run through SMUG. And I'll, I'll show you how they fit into the current sort of learning pathways. So this is what we would consider a basic procedure in ultrasound guided injections. So uh, top right, we've got a transverse image of the supraspinatus. So this is supraspinatus here. This is the humeral head. This is deltoid. Here's the needle coming in and you can see the fluid going into the potential space of the subacromial bursa. This was about five or six mils, maybe a little bit more. So you can see where that potential space is. This down here is a longitudinal image um, of the supraspinatus. So again, it's a subacromial bursal injection using an in-plane approach. And those are just two different approaches uh, to doing a bursal injection. So other basic procedures are gonna be uh, injections like an ankle joint, a knee joint, obviously, um, an AC joint, um, and then as we go into more into deeper joints, we would generally consider them to be slightly more advanced. They're certainly technically more difficult to carry out. Um, and then other advanced procedures, um, which really we couldn't do without ultrasound. For example, something that we do teach on our courses is the barbitage lavage. Um, I do quite a few of these. I think it's an incredibly effective treatment and often can prevent people um, requiring surgery. So this is a uh, barbitage procedure where you put the needle through the calcification and try and aspirate the, um, the uh, calcification. Okay, another advanced procedure, uh, which essentially is a normal uh, intra-articular glenohumeral joint injection, um, but is a hydrodilatation. So you can see here on the left, the needle coming down. This is a lateral approach, in-plane approach. Um, this is the labrum, this is the uh, glenoid and this is the humerus so you can see the lifting up and these are pr procedures that you just cannot do without ultrasound guidance um, so it's really opened up a whole different type of injections and certainly with the advent of things like sono surgery this is an area that is getting developed um, every year sorry about that so this is a hydrodilatation so who comes on our courses well, one thing that I really like about our courses is that we get such a mix of professions. So physios, orthopedic surgeons, radiologists, sports doctors, sonographers, and normally it is quite an even balance between all those different um, uh, disciplines. There's not many courses out there where all these different disciplines are trying to learn the same skill. So it actually makes for a really interesting um, learning pathway. Sorry about that. Um, but at the same time, what is really important is that those people that come um, onto the course um, have a different skill set. So a physio is going to have a different skill set 
to an orthopedic surgeon, to a radiologist. And when you're thinking about the pathway that you need to take, it's important that you think about what your current skill set is. We also then need to look at what it takes to do an ultrasound guided injection, and then you can work out what you need to uh, try and improve on to get that skill. So if we look here in the middle, we wanna be able to carry out an ultrasound guided injection. So what are the different components that it requires to carry out that skill? Well, obviously you need to be doing some sort of course. You need to have some basic ultrasound skills. There is no point spending a lot of money on an ultrasound guided injection course if you don't have good solid probe skills and ultrasound skills. And we would generally say that that would be anything between three to six months. But again, that I would suggest that is a minimum. The people that get on, uh, that make the best progress with ultrasound guided injections and get the most out of our courses are the ones that have developed some basic ultrasound skills already. Obviously, you also need to have injection skills. So a bit like Lorenzo was saying, um, as for example, as a physiotherapist or as a sonographer or an, as an osteopath, I'd never carried out an injection in my life. So I needed to get those basic skills of carrying out an injection um, before I could even think about carrying out an ultrasound guided injection. Whereas most doctors, certainly orthopedic surgeons, quite used to sticking things into patients and therefore that that part of the learning pathway might be something that they are quite comfortable with already and therefore would be less of a focus. Because I think that's a really important point. Uh, I think the, I, I concur with that. I think I've taught on your courses for many, many years and I think the practitioners that get the most out of the weekend courses are, are really those that have some basic ultrasound and injection skills. So it's usually the doctors that have done a few injections that have also done some ultrasound. And I think there's no point in going on a weekend course if you don't have any of those skills. It just doesn't make sense and uh, you don't get anything out of it. And I think people actually find it quite frustrating because everybody, lots of other people will be progressing and finding the needle and getting the joint. Whereas if you just don't have that, that motor skill then it, then it can be quite frustrating. There is one group of, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, Lorenzo, there does seem to be a group, the orthopaedic surgeons, that seem to walk in with very few motor skills uh, and pick this up quite quickly. Well, um, I, think, I think part of that is because they have such exceptional hand-eye coordination. Yeah. They're looking at TV screens all the time, so they're an exception to the group. But I think, generally speaking, be it physio or doctors, you need to have those basic skills um, before you can go on these courses. Yeah. And then we come up against the two biggest barriers, I would say, for, um, uh, for getting good or progressing with ultrasound guided injections. And it, it, the first thing is getting supervised practice. So when I learned ultrasound guided injections, I was working uh, in an NHS department as a, an extended scope physiotherapist and I was working with other clinicians that could supervise me. Um, and when it comes to learning diagnostic ultrasound or ultrasound guided injections, if you're on your own, so in this isolated sort of clinic where there's nobody else learning it as well, it really does become quite tricky and your learning pathway will probably, or how long it will take you to get competent will probably be a little bit uh, longer. Um, so supervised practice is really important um, for, for progressing your skills and, and that can be quite tricky. The other thing that I, I really want to sort of get across is if you, if you don't think that you're going to have the capacity in your clinic to carry out lots of injections each month, then it's unlikely you are ever going to become very proficient at that skill. So if you're just doing two or three injections a month, it's very unlikely you're going to develop the skills and become proficient. So in terms of supervised practice, we'll come, in, we'll come on to this, um, but as an absolute minimum in a six month period, you would be looking to do around 35 injections. I'll come on to roughly where that comes on to, although it is partly made up and from experience. In terms of access to clients, I, again, this is my opinion, is I think you should be doing, and I'd be interested to see what other people think, and Lorenzo, probably around 20 injections, so that's only five a week, 
to maintain your skills, become competent, and further than just competency, to become proficient, which is something we'll talk about in a minute. The other thing that really does vary in terms of how long your personal learning pathway will be, will be, as Lorenzo mentioned, is related to pharmacology. So as a physiotherapist, I didn't have a clue about pharmacology before I went down the injection route. And probably it's only since I've done my independent prescribing um, that have I actually developed uh, the skills um, or that really in-depth knowledge that you need from a pharmacological point of view. Um, and again, for some doctors, GPs, um, that is going to be uh, a bit more straightforward than, for example, a physio, an osteo or sonographer that just don't cover this in their basic training or in a lot of the postgraduate training. Um, so there's quite a few elements there that you need to make sure you've got in place before you embark on training in the first place or before you can make the progress that you need to become a proficient injector. So Chris, I just want to make a point about doctors because quite a few doctors on this call. Uh, so if you're a MSK doctor that's done some MSK training, you do landmark guided injections, you're really interested in ultrasound, ultrasound guided interventions. Then for you, it might be a case of, because you've got the pharmacology, you've got the basic understanding of doing landmark guided injections, for you, it might be becoming somewhat proficient in ultrasound and the use of a probe, and then going on a weekend course and then getting some supervision as well. So that could be the combination and that can be quite accelerated. Uh, the other option is, is doing something a little bit more advanced, such as the PG cert which incorporates uh, a lot of the pharmacology that you probably already know, but then also adds on top of that the, the mentorship, which you need that supervised training that you need. Mm. And then there are other practitioners like maybe orthopedic surgeons that, uh, you know, want to do ultrasound guided injections. Uh, they may, and because they've got such good hand-eye um, coordination, they might need to just do some weekend courses. And, and practice doing injections under ultrasound guidance. So that, that might be enough for them within their limited scope of practice. So they want to do hip joint injections or shoulder joint injections. That might be enough for them to, to uh, be competent in that particular area. Mm. And I think that just goes to show how it is very, it's specific to your, your job, your role, and also specific to the department that you work in. So I just thought I'd talk you through my personal learning pathway, because there's quite a few components to it. Um, so for me, it all started off, I did a, an unguided injection course. I started doing unguided injections. This is before I, I even um, embarked on doing ultrasound. I then developed my ultrasound skills. I did a postgraduate certificate. So I had my unguided injection skills, which included going through the pharmacology, et cetera. And I also had my, um, guide, uh, my musculoskeletal ultrasound skills through my PG cert. As soon as you have both of those skills, it makes no sense to not embark on ultrasound guided injections, um, in my opinion. As a private, as somebody that now totally works in private practice, if you are a physio who works in private practice, you have to do your independent prescribing because you then need to be able to get the medication to do the, uh, for example, if you're going to do a steroid injection. I now work in private practice, so I am an independent prescriber, which means that I can prescribe for, for each individual patient that I um, inject. If you're not in private practice and you're going down the NHS route, so on the, on the left-hand side here, once I'd done my injection training, once I'd done my ultrasound training, I then did 50 supervised injections. And what we did with that is um, we bought in the time of an external clinician and they supervised us doing ultrasound guided injections on our NHS patients. We did 50 injections each. And at the same time, and I can't um, emphasize how important this is, in your own time, you need to be um, recording a logbook of your injections. Now, let's make this really clear. This 50 injections and this 250 logged injections 
was based off the local guidelines of the NHS facility. Now I know from speaking to lots of people, these guidelines aren't in place. So we look to the CSP, which is the Chartered Society of Physio, the sports doctors will look to the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine, the radiologists will look towards the RCR, um, and, and sonographers obviously will look um, towards their associations as well. And you won't find an answer as to how many injections it requires to be considered competent. That nobody's put it down in terms of how many numbers. So these numbers are based on experience and based on some guidelines or some articles that have been written. And once we'd done that, we, we were able to do these independent uh, on our NHS patients. And from that, you would suggest that we have gained a competency in ultrasound guided injections. But obviously, as we all know, it doesn't stop there. You've got to continue logging your injections. And this is a consistent and constant um, cycle of auditing um, and, and developing your competency to becoming proficient. Chris, I, I would uh, suggest that that's an absolute minimum if you want to yeah. become... Uh, so, yeah, let me, let me continue, Lorenzo. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's two things that I want people to consider here, and I get the question all the time, what do I need to become competent? What do I need to become competent? And that is an essential question because you need to prove your competency. You need to prove your, uh, that you are competent within your scope of practice to show that you have a basic training. Now, competency is the bare minimum for acceptability. Okay. Proficiency is what we're all after. We want to be able to do an ultrasound guided injection of whatever joint, even if you haven't done that specific joint before, because you can take the skills you learn in your competency based training and you can transfer that into whatever injection you want to do. And that's when you're proficient. And we're after proficiency. There's nothing worse than having an ultrasound scan in your hand, having passed your postgraduate certificate, but being rubbish. OK, so when it comes to competency, we're talking at, from the postgraduate certificate that I run, you need to do 35 supervised ultrasound guided injections. That is the bare min minimum that I would suggest you have to have over a six month period. And when it comes to competency, it has to it's always down to a certain period of time. So it can't be 200 because it's not going to fit into that pathway so competency around 35 again that could be much higher but within the course that we do that is how many we believe you can achieve in the time required to be competent proficiency i must have done 10,000 injections and i think i'm getting there you know it takes a long long time to become proficient and it's not necessarily a number that you can put on it obviously i have here um, but for everybody that is going to be slightly different. So competency and proficiency are two different things. Going back to competency, because that is the question that I get all the time, competency is actually based on two things, the recommendations of your professional body and your local guidelines within your department, of which there are often very few written ultrasound guided injection pathways. But your competency is going to be different depending on what you do. So here's some examples. A hip surgeon, these are all real life examples that have come on our courses. A hip surgeon that wants to carry out ultrasound guided hip injections, intraarticular, instead of using fluoroscopy. As Lorenzo's already presented, ultrasound guided injections are as accurate as fluoroscopy guided, they are as effective and they are a lot, lot cheaper. So for that hip surgeon, that was the skill that he wanted to learn and therefore his competency based training should be around that. A podiatrist obviously wants to inject just the foot and ankle. So their competency should be around the foot and ankle. And I would suggest that if you're just doing one body part, it's around 100 guided injections to really start feeling very, very proficient. If you're talking about the foot and ankle, if you're just talking about one hip joint injection, just the hip joint then it's probably around 50. 
to really get that basic minimum requirement that you can say, I have done this many and therefore I would consider this to be a competency level. And it goes on obviously for the shoulder extended scope physio, if their competency is just around the shoulder, then it's gonna be a shorter learning pathway uh, to proficiency compared to a physio like myself that does all the injections. I think, yeah, I think you get my point in terms of defining your own competency. And this is um, something I came up with uh, yesterday because I was trying to get across um, the different skill sets that we have already and how we need to develop those skill sets. So these are the different professions that we teach. And along the top, this is what I believe it takes or what myself and Lorenzo would believe it takes to get good at guided injections. The first thing is you have to have some basic ultrasound skills. You need them, otherwise you're gonna find this quite difficult. If you're an orthopedic surgeon, you can see that you've already got quite a few of the other skills. So therefore your learning pathway is probably gonna be shorter than a physiotherapist or a sonographer, for example. And therefore the pathway that you take is likely to be different. A radiologist, again, they have a lot of the skills set already, um, and therefore their learning pathway is potentially a little bit shorter and it does vary. Same with GPs and sports doctors and A&E consultants. Now, when it comes to physios, osteos and sonographers, a lot of this is quite new. And therefore, I would suggest the learning pathway is going to be longer and you are going to need to look towards postgraduate certificates and standardised learning pathways. In terms of just as a summary of everything I've said, you need good access to an ultrasound machine and basic ultrasound uh, skills. If you don't have injection skills, then you need to either go and get it through an unguided course, or you need to start developing those skills on the job under supervision. Now, the traditional pathway for physiotherapists uh, would be what I did, an unguided injection course, and then you start doing ultrasound, and then you start doing an ultrasound guided injection. Uh, so then you start doing ultrasound guided injections. We've changed that um, with uh, the, the UEL course, which is the, uh, the first ultrasound guided injection university, university accredited course. We started it in September. We're doing another cohort in September. So within that, we would expect you to have basic ultrasound skills as a prerequisite before you come on the course. But on the course, we cover all the pharmacology, all the medical legal aspects, uh, all the consent process, et cetera, et cetera, as you would get on an unguided in cor course, but we've integrated it into a guided course. So we also have guided injection training um, in a cadaveric lab um, as well as um, uh, in the classroom. If you are an orthopedic surgeon, if you're a doctor, if you've got good ultrasound skills already, then you probably aren't looking to such a long learning pathway. And then I would advise that you're looking towards a cadaveric course for two days. We do one as part of SMUG, but there are others to try and develop those ultrasound guided injection skills. And normally, if you've got good ultrasound skills and you've got the other skill sets that are required, like the injection skills, then after a two day course, you should be able to start carrying out basic ultrasound guided injections. Um, for example, the acromioclavicular joint, the knee, the ankle, uh, the subacromial bursa. Things like an intraarticular hip and glenohumeral joint, and obviously the advanced procedures such as barbitage and lavage, unless you're coming onto that course with already some skills in the basic guided injections, then it's likely uh, that you will need further training after that. So at the end of this, you should have a good foundation of your skills and knowledge. You have to have supervised injections, whatever pathway you take, and you need to have a logbook of injections. And I put cadaveric skill training in there because I would suggest that, you know, to get a good uh, amount of practice, uh, that you should be also looking to do some sort of cadaveric training, unless you've got very good supervision um, on site. <clears throat> And there's just a few tips. Um, our website, ultrasoundtraining.co.uk, has got lots of um, resources on it in terms of how to get started. And everything I've just talked about um, is on there. I've done articles if you're a physio, a sports doctor, an osteo, in terms of how to get good 
uh, ultrasound guided injections. And I'm sure some of this will come up in the um, questions as well. So the two main courses that we teach are the two day cadaveric course uh, at St George's in London. And we also do one in Leeds. Um, and then the more formal learning pathway is a postgraduate certificate in ultrasound guided injections, which is once a year at the University of East London. Just one other thing I want to mention, um, there's my details if anybody has any questions. Um, if you are um, interested in ultrasound, ultrasound guide injections, we've got about 500 people now on our Smug Ultrasound Forum, which is a closed group on Facebook. And every day people are posting scans, posting questions, um, and it's a really good peer learning experience. Um, so if anybody's got any questions uh, or any good cases, then you're going to get a lot of feedback from exper very experienced clinicians from all over the world. So if you're interested in joining that, uh, then please go ahead uh, via Facebook. And that's that. Thank you very much. So just to give us some context and to give Lorenzo and Chris some context when they're answering, if we're going to just give you a couple of questions to ask uh, for you to answer. So if you could just say where you're based and what your main profession is, that will help the guys. And while but they're being completed, so we've had a question that's sent through here asking about other allied health professionals. So Lorenzo, what are your thoughts on nurse practitioners with independent prescribing and sports medicine qualifications being involved? Uh, so, so the question is what I think about other allied health being involved in, in injection. I, I, I mean, this, this I, is referring to nurse practitioners who've got specific qualifications, but getting involved with on, onto this sort of educational pathway. I mean, I think I, I think I, I have no problems with allied health doing injection therapy and doing ultrasound guided injections. I, I've worked with Chris. Chris is a physiotherapist. He's got lots and lots of experience. I teach. I teach physios. In fact, I teach more physios than doctors. Uh, so I have no issues with uh, physiotherapists uh, or other allied health doing injections. However, I would caution you that this is a skill that requires. Um, it requires a lot of training and a lot of expertise. And I think it's not gonna, you're not gonna gain the skill by doing a weekend course. And that's what I see time and time again, doing smug courses or doing other courses. So I see people coming on these courses thinking they'll learn all about ultrasound guided injections uh, over a weekend and that's just not probable or not possible. So you need to think about all the issues that Chris has discussed there, depending on who you are, doctor or physiotherapist, uh, and you need to set out your pathway from the very beginning. And it's a steep learning curve, uh, you know, and, and you realize it, you don't realize it until you actually start the process. It's actually quite a difficult process. You got any comments, Chris? I'm trying to think, I've, I've never had a nurse, specifically, I think the question was about nurse practitioners and I, I, I don't think we've ever had a nurse practitioner, uh, I might be wrong, on our ultrasound guide injection course. But um, I think what's happening in lots of different, dis there's loads of ultrasound is just overlaps loads of different professions. And actually in itself, it's its own specialism. Um, so I agree with Lorenzo. I think the principles of what I've talked about are exactly the same, uh, depending on what discipline you are. Um, but if you are a nurse that's thinking about doing this, then you've got to make sure you've got all those bits in place where you're going to have lots of access to supervision, to patients. Also Ultrasound skill, pharmacology skill, uh, and then injection skill, and then move on to ultrasound guided injections, putting it all together. Mm. Okay, great. Here are the results in terms of that, so it'll help give some context. So predominantly UK, as to be expected, and then... Yeah. And that's a fair reflection of what our courses are. Mm. And then profession-wise, again, quite uh, the balance with physio being the main one at 30%. Yeah. What, what about that, Chris? Is that similar to what you would have thought from your courses? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I get emails every week from physios, sports doctors, orthopedic surgeons. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully, that's the first time I presented it like that, but hopefully that's given people some ideas so they can relate to what experience have they got and what do they need to get and how are they going to get it. There's lots of barriers uh, and you've just got to you've got to break down those barriers. You've got to, unfortunately, you have to spend a lot of money to get there. Um, and as Lorenzo said at the beginning, and, and as I think I've alluded to, if you're not getting the hands-on experience and you don't have the patience, this is a very difficult skill. I think the mentorship, the supervision is absolute key uh, for most practitioners. And I think you need that 
uh, you know, I, I uh, did set up a position just recently, unfortunately, because of COVID that's been put on hold, but of, of mentoring uh, FCM registrars. But I think the key is to try and get that mentorship because your learning will just accelerate if you do have that, that direct supervision and reflection. Yeah, there's a lot of questions on, on mentorship. And as you've both mentioned, in terms of university, and you, you talked about it there, Chris, mm. it'd be interesting before I asked you the question, just to see what other people, what, what do they see as being the, yeah, the requirements yeah. for this? So if you could all answer this question, that would be interesting. What do you think the answer will be, Chris? So... The answer is it depends. The So the, the answer is no, you mm. don't have to do a university accredited course because there is just not that plat. There's not that black and white um, document that says you have to do it at this point. If I, if in the NHS as a physiotherapist, when I was working back then, I had, I'm in what I call a protected environment. I'm working under the umbrella of the NHS I've got radiologists next door. I've got four other physios learning the same thing. I've got the NHS insurance banner over the top of me. I'm in that protected environment and therefore I, don't, I, I didn't need to do an ultrasound guided injection university course in theory. I had to do some sort of injection training as according to the CSP guidelines. Now, in private practice or in different environments, you know, you may need that university courts because you need the you need to tick that box, um, and certainly, I so therefore I think it just depends on on where you're working and also your profession. Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned that you know with doctors, it might be that uh, if you do have some uh, colleagues that can supervise you, it might be a matter of just attending online, uh, doing an online course. Uh, so sonar skills online course, or then doing a weekend course, uh, SMUG provide the weekend courses, and that might be sufficient for you in addition to some mentorship or some supervised injection training. If you're a physiotherapist who, who works privately, that can be a lot more difficult to, to gain those skills, and maybe a PG cert is perfect for you. Uh, and, then, and then moving from competency to proficiency will require extra work. So really, I agree, it depends on who you are, what your circumstances are, what your previous training is. Um, but there are, the good thing here now is there is a structure now where there wasn't a structure. Chris, when, when you and I uh, learned ultrasound guided injections, there was no structure. Well, I, so totally agree with you, Lorenzo, but I think it's important for people to realise we are making this structure up. There's nobody else doing this. Yeah, so, true. So it is, it's new territory, if you like. My, but my point we've is, waited long enough for other people, we've waited long enough for other professional bodies to try and come up with it, yeah. and they're not going to. I by agree, the agree. Opinion, so. But the point is, there is, there is the beginning of the structure. Yeah. Um, and, and, and not only uh, in physiotherapy, but also, for example, in SEM, we now have uh, an, an exam that we have to complete to, to show proficiency um, in ultrasound. That's not ultrasound guided injection. But nobody's doing it. Yeah, there is a structure. There is yeah. a structure there. Yeah. No, I think we're going in the right direction, but I think uh, we there's a long way to go. And unfortunately, because every profession has a different professional body, essentially we're not going to get something across the board that says this is this is the basic stuff you've got to do but at the same time i think within the guidelines i've presented there is a pretty obvious this is what you should be doing even if it's not a university accredited course you need a logbook you need supervised scans you need evidence of learning you need reflective you know and that essentially is therefore your your competency if you're a clinician and if i said to you Great. Show, so you're doing guided injections. That's brilliant. So show me your evidence. And they go, well, I did a two day course. OK, show me some scans that you've done. Show me some videos of some guided injection. You know, if there's no evidence, then I think then don't get me wrong. In some place, you know, that might be OK. But I don't think if we're doing it the right way that there's a clear uh, I think, you know, we need to ensure that we include those elements that like I said in it. Yeah. 
Well, it was pretty mixed anyway. I actually, you started answering halfway through, so that did actually impact Chris. That the uh, <laughs> did it change? Yeah, the nose went up a bit, so you've got <laughs> some, you've got some good <laughs> there. So that's good. Um, yeah, so pretty balanced. So again, that's backing up what what you guys are saying there in terms of being quite subjective. So just to, we've got a lot of questions coming through here. Some of them talking about the the current situation in regards to the pandemic, and very difficult question for you to answer. But how do you see that impacting, I mean, not treatments, forget those for the time being, but in terms of supervision, clinic, courses, do you have any any thoughts on, on what's going to be happening with that going forward? Uh, that's very yeah, good. I mean, we've cancelled all courses up till July at the moment, and then who knows at the moment? I mean, I, I don't think anybody knows what yeah, we... we I, I think it's, it's completely up in the air. As far as injection therapy is concerned, I mean, there's some theoretical risk that cortisone, if you if you if you if you're having cortisone, either medication or or, or you have a cortisone injection, then there might be a theoretical risk of um, you know increased risk of of contracting COVID. Uh, but really, that's all up in the air, and it's uh, there's there's been no real evidence for that at the moment. It, it, it's it's very hard to say what's going to happen. It, like like any injection, it has to be done on a case by case basis. So I know you know injections are still being carried out as we speak, but it should just be for those emergencies, um, uh, and and therefore it's just you know it's it's a discussion to have with the patient, isn't it? But yeah, and there's whether uh, and also whether the patient has other risk factors, absolutely, yeah, or um, you know a worse prognosis with yeah. that. I think I think it would be silly or ill-advised to be doing any steroid injections on anyone with with other um, comorbidities or risks that would would relate that would be related to getting um, the virus. Okay, thank you. And um, this one for you, Chris. This one came through a little earlier, which I thought you might have bitten on, but it was asking about scanners, and someone suggested the butterfly. Well, I did. I responded. You did. I missed that. Sorry, I was listening. So. Um, yeah, so I've done, if you go onto the website, I've done a, a whole blog on the butterfly machine because I was getting lots of questions. Um, uh, we did a course where people, and in the blog I say that we had three people turn up with a two and a half thousand pound butterfly machine um, and they regretted the decision within a year, uh, within a, an hour of scanning with just a, a, a standard machine. Um, so yeah, so uh, you, you do not buy a butterfly to carry out musculoskeletal imaging as it stands. Simple as that. The image and quality isn't good systems, enough. Systems, Chris, like, are, there, are there any prerequisites yeah. or minimum requirements that you would suggest? Um, you yeah, you so do. I mean, we all know that the more you spend, the, the better the machine that you get. But yeah, I think generally speaking, if, if we take out the handheld market and we just talk about a normal sort of portable machine, you'd be spending at least £10,000 to get a machine that will do everything that you want it to do. Um, lots of machines can cope with a superficial scan uh, or a superficial injection of around two to three to four centimetres, but, but the better machines are going to see the deeper areas. Um, uh, you're going you're gonna to gain a better image quality at, at more depth, uh, which obviously for certain injections you're going you're gonna to need. Okay. And also one question we've had through as well is about software related to systems. So how important is it to have something with specific um, injection software? Yes, yeah, good question. So um, I don't know about Lorenzo, but most experienced injectors will not use needle visualization on their, you, you certainly can, but most of us won't use needle visualization that often so although when you buy a machine you think oh i really want needle visualization anything that's going to help me see the needle I, certainly from my own experience i probably used it for about three months and in the end you don't need it I mean, so I... that most machines now um and, and uh, andy your machine the alpinian which is what i'm trying out at the moment the logic ge that i use they all have needle visualization most reasonable machines have it now but it, it's most people that do a lot of injections don't use it. I, I would concur with that. I, I, I've never even, I don't even know what they offer really as far as need, needle visualization is concerned. So I, I think just stick with a reasonably good machine and then it's all about practicing. I think 90% yeah. of the image is what you produce, not what the ultrasound produces. So don't rely on the ultrasound to produce the image. You need to do that. 
and that involves you know techniques that involving using the probe and, and using the needles uh, and that's that they're all techniques that you'll be learning on these courses and you mentioned probes are there any suggestions around that in terms of what would be advisable I mean I think if you're starting out with ultrasound you want to buy an ultrasound machine you need at least obviously one probe and the the key probe would be the linear uh, high frequency probe and so that will enable you to do most injections in most people you might struggle a little bit with with um, patients that are particularly large you know the big rugby players or obese um, patients you might struggle with shoulder and hip joint injections but generally speaking if you're if you've got for most people you need just one probe and then you can look at you know other potential probes so one you might, you might look at the hockey stick probe for uh, hand and foot um, uh, injections uh, and you might look at the um, curvilinear probes for, for uh, larger joints like the hip joint. Okay, great. Right, again, before we go into the next topic, it's another thing which we've, we've had a lot of questions about. So, guys, what are your thoughts on doing landmark or garden injections before actually doing ultrasound garden injections? Chris, I'm going to come to you on that one. Um, so the, uh, so if you are good at ultrasound and you, the natural thing for you to do from an injection point of view is ultrasound guided injections, then in my opinion, and because when you do guided injections, you don't ever want to do unguided injections. And when you know diagnostic ultrasound, you know, you can't get it in the spot. So if you're already good at ultrasound, you go down the ultrasound guided injection route straight away okay if you or if you don't have ultrasound skills and you don't have injection skills then obviously going off and doing an unguided injection course um, will get you injecting etc so for example if you're in the nhs and you know you they think they want you to do injections but you don't have ultrasound skills then sure go and do a unguided injection course um but I, 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 I would agree so I, i'd agree i think I think any skill is a good skill. <laughs> so, and I think it's, you know, if you're learning ultrasound guided injections from a very low base, it takes you years and years to develop that, that competency or proficiency. So if you've already got the landmark guided injection skills, then I think it's a, a shorter hoop to, to, to jump over. Uh, and so I think, you know, landmark guided injections, if you've got access to that or you've got access to courses, I think, I really think um, it's, it's not going to be a disadvantage. It's going to be anything, it's going to be an advantage to learn that particular skill. Yeah. Okay, great. And just going back a while, is, as physios are the most um, prominent on this call, Craig has asked how he'd recommend getting basic injection experience if it's a physio. It just depends where yeah it depends so you can you know to to get good at injections you need to be injecting someone so for example in my private practice anybody that wants to inject basically we recommend they go and work one or two days a week away from the practice in the nhs the nhs is the only way you are going to get a large number of patients to get this skill Okay. So there you go. It has to be in the NHS. There's no other way of getting the um, the number to develop your injection skills. If you work in private practice and you're in quite a big practice and you've got patients that will refer to you, then sure, you can start doing injections on those patients um, if you're an independent prescriber. But then you'll probably need to buy in the time of somebody to supervise you. So that's what I've done in the past is I've been to practices, they've got five injections lined up, I go in there and I supervise them and sign them off on those five injections. So that works and that's similar to what I did. Um, but yeah. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question. Was it Craig, did you say? Craig, yes. Yeah, let me know Craig on the chat if that didn't. Okay, and in terms of general competency with, with ultrasound scanning, is that done on a, uh, a normal sports medicine diploma or certificate, Lorenzo? Uh, so ultrasound guided injections? 
no, so, no, no just, just scanning sounds just purely ultrasound itself that was a question as well so, so this is this is one of my big bugbears <laughs> unfortunately uh is is uh you know i'm, I'm pushing pushing for the sports medicine consultants or registrars to to learn ultrasound i think it's a really important skill it's it's you know not uh it's a skill that obviously will um uh accompany clinical skills, but as a general rule, most don't get uh, the training that I would like them to get um, through their uh, registrar training. So the answer is a lot of them don't get the ultrasound, uh, ultrasound skills and you need to supplement that with either courses or sitting in or supervised work. Okay. So can I just answer Charlie's question? Independent prescribing is a completely separate course um, to the to the guided injection PG cert. So I did my independent prescribing at University of Hertfordshire, um, and that's a whole different learning pathway. Very similar in terms of you need a supervisor, you have to do 90 mentored hours. So the learning pathway for a physio is long. Independent prescribing, diagnostic ultrasound, ultrasound guided injections. It's a long, I think it's a, I think it's a two to three year learning pathway. It's absolutely worth doing in my opinion, um, but it's a long pathway. And I don't think people get that often. Oh, um, I agree, what, I agree. A com, what a commitment it is. And I said this in the last webinar, and I think this is really important because I've been thinking a lot about all of this recently. You've also got to accept that if you're going to embark on ultrasound and ultrasound guide injections, you are going to compromise some of your, your other skill set. You can't do it all. So you've got to make that decision whether this is where you want to go, because this is the way if you're going to embark on ultrasound, ultrasound guide injections, that is going to be a massive part of your time, your energy. Uh, and it will also attract the patients that are after that. So you've got to bear that in mind. If you know, if you're a rehab expert and you want to do that for seventy-five percent of the week, then you can't just squeeze twenty-five percent of the week with this sort of stuff. Mm. A big commitment. It's a whole. I'm not going to say it's a whole new profession because at heart I completely still feel like a physio, but it is a whole new skill set. I agree. I agree. You can't be everything for everyone. So you've got to actually. Um... I've tried, and it doesn't work. <laughs> There's an interesting question here about mentorship and about uh, medical legal aspects. This is a really important point. Um, certainly in the NHS, when I'm mentoring patients and in the military, um, uh, I've asked my medical insurance about this. And, and, and certainly, uh, as long as the patient doing the injection has medical indemnity, you as a mentor will be covered um, for any mistakes that are made or any liability as a result of, of the person doing the injection. Um, uh, any, any liability as a result of that injection. So there, there, that, there, there shouldn't be a medical legal issue associated with mentorship. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, another question here. So I've completed the PGC in MSK ultrasound. How will this be viewed in application for the ultrasound guided PGC slash D for the University of East London MSK ultrasound program that you're involved in, Chris? Yeah. So can you ex expect exemptions from the areas that are already studied? Yeah, so definitely no exemptions. There's absolutely no overlap between the two modules. There's so much to cover in the, in the ultrasound guided injection because you've got to do your pharmacology, your medical legal, et cetera, et cetera. So if you've done, I think, um, if you've done your postgraduate certificate in ultrasound, then you qualify as to go into the postgraduate certificate in ultrasound guided injections. Once you've done those two, then yes, you can, that's a postgraduate diploma, which, excuse me, that you apply for. But yeah, there's no exemptions, there's no overlap. The postgraduate in ultrasound guided injections is not about learning to scan. It's about learning to carry out ultrasound guided injection doing, and doing the injection side of it. We haven't said that you have to have an ultrasound guided injection, uh, sorry, ultrasound PG cert to go on to the PG cert and guided injections as long as you've got a basic level of competency in ultrasound itself. So we run the smug mentorship and we've had quite a few people from our mentorship into the guided injection pathway through the university. Okay. Great. So I'd also a question have come through here. So this is for someone based in the NHS. Mm -hmm. So as sonography isn't a protected title, 
Yeah. How would you advise them to progress to get these staff able to uh, inject? This is talking about overseas people who haven't got a regulatory body in the UK. S sorry, say that again? So basically, I'll just read the full question. So yeah. both overseas sonographers, one is a radiologist from the Philippines and the other is a biomedical scientist. Neither of them have a regulatory body in the UK. And this appears to be a mandatory to hold a postgraduate diploma. Since sonography isn't a protected title, how do you advise we progress as a trust to allow these staff to inject? This is outside the UK. This is this is in the UK. Uh, I'm a bit confused. So they're, they're they're from overseas and they've they've got their training there, but they've not got anything since they've been in the UK. Yeah. So I, I, for, I, again, I don't really know, but I do actually get this question quite a lot. My understanding is if they've got no registered. Um, uh, in theory, profession in the UK, then they, they need to go back to the undergraduate side. Okay. But but if they can email me that and I can, what I can do is pass that on to our links at UEL who will know all about what can be transferred from different universities. That's essentially what they're talking about there. Okay, great. And one thing we've not touched on is medication, Lorenzo. Mm -hmm. Where do you get that from and how easy is that to access? Well, I mean, if it, as a doctor, you can prescribe it yourself. Um, so it, it's not for yourself, but obviously for the patients. Uh, so it's quite easy for a physiotherapist. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, um, but if you're not an independent prescriber, you need a, a GP or another doctor to prescribe the medications for you. So there can be a little bit of a barrier there. Um, but yep. generally speaking, for medical practitioners, there's no barrier at all because you can prescribe the medications. It's usually in local anaesthetic and cortisone. For physiotherapists, depends on whether you've got an independent prescriber um, degree or whether you um, look at. Chris, you can you can um, yeah. correct me there. So um, if so, working in private practice, in theory, I could ring up Lorenzo and say I've got um, a person that needs a steroid injection for a shoulder. Can you do a patient-specific directive? So can you prescribe the drug for me to inject it? So there are people in the country using that method. I don't see, I don't, I don't like that method. Um, I think it's fine in certain cases. I don't see why Lorenzo would prescribe for me. I don't understand that relationship. So for me as a physio working in private practice, I would strongly advocate that you become an independent prescriber. And at some point that might be what's required. In the NHS, it's a totally different ball game um, because you can have patient uh, PGDs or patient group directives where they can, you can, uh, there is a um, structure where I can, I can inject a shoulder under this PGD, which has been organ, uh, that's been set up by the pharmacists, the physios, the doctors, uh, pharma, etc. So, yeah, so essentially, it's. it's I, I work in, I work in the military, and I have a few physiotherapists that I work with. We do multidisciplinary clinics, and they would inject. Um, patients uh, with my supervision and with what you're talking about there, the PGD um, supervision. So there's no issue with regard to um, cortisone injections or prescribing medications in, yeah. in that situation. Um, what, just one question, and if you don't mind, pick up from Lewis. Uh, good question. Um, would you recommend if you're already an independent prescriber with non-guided injection experience, would you still recommend the postgraduate course? And if you think about what I presented, and, and Lewis might be able to answer on this, I, I uh, from what he said, so he's an independent prescriber, he's got non-guided injection experience, which is great. So he's already got two out of the main three. The third thing is, can you scan? So there's no point doing a postgraduate course in ultrasound guide injections if you can't scan. We, we wouldn't let you on the course. So the next thing is for him to learn how to scan, and then he's got all three that can turn into... Uh, and being able to carry out ultrasound guided injections. Okay, great. And then question from Owen, talking about steroid preference for joint injection. I mean, that really depends on the type of joint you're doing, but generally speaking, you've got, you've got three types of cortisone. You've got methylprednisolone, you've got triamcinolone and hydrocortisone, although hydrocortisone is a bit more difficult to get. But generally speaking, if you're looking at uh, joints, you would be, uh, considering either methylprednisolone or triamcinolone. There is some evidence that maybe triamcinolone is a little bit more potent, and as a result of being more potent, then it potentially could cause more 
um, side effects like uh, skin side effects. So if you're doing a superficial injection, I'd try and stay away from the triamcinolone and, and look at, at using a lower dose methylprednisolone. So these are all the, the um, concepts that you'll learn on courses if you do, particularly if you do, do a PG cert course or, or even a weekend course, we often discuss the differences in the pharmacology. Yeah. Okay, great. We've slightly run over time, but I'm sure everyone can stick around a little bit longer. But Chris, is there anything that you've we've talked a lot about the information there? Are there any take home messages that you would pass on to the, uh, the attendees just to what they can go away with? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I think hopefully I've presented some information where they can, you know, and um, we, we can send the slides around. That's no problem to try and look at those charts that I've come up with and work out what skill set do they currently have and what do they need to fill the gaps to be able to get to where they need to, where they want to get to. And if they haven't even started on the pathway yet, then really think carefully about what do you need to do? How are you going to get there? And are you working in the right environment? So two of our physios, we've said working in private practice, you've got great ultrasound skills, but you are, I'm not going to let you practice on my patients. You know, this is my clinic. I want you coming back when you're good at it. So they've gone off. They're still working in the NHS. They've developed their injection skills. They're doing ultrasound guided injections and they're coming back into the practice and working under my supervision. So that's what we've done. They had a missing gap. There was a gap, which was where are they going to get their patients from to inject in private practice? We don't have that facility and I, I don't want that. So they went back into the NHS. Bearing in mind that's the route I took, that's the natural way for this to be done. So, um, so this, yeah. this is from a sports and exercise medicine perspective, I think it's really important if I'm a young SEM registrar, what I would do would be get access to a machine, start learning ultrasound guided injections, and then consider, because you've got often SEM doctors, SEM registrars have uh, landmark guided injection skills, gain your ultrasound, guided, uh, ultrasound skills, and then look at maybe doing some supplemental courses, weekend courses, there's online courses, or maybe considering a PG cert uh, injection course. Um, for which we are currently recruiting. Um, so what well, I was gonna say, some of these questions on the right hand side, I know we're running out of time, but if you just email chris at ultrasoundtraining.co.uk, then I'd be more than happy to answer some of it. Uh, Redmi said, are there plans to, uh, teach in Spain um, there is now so do drop me an email <laughs> <laughs> great work yeah no well, thank you for that Chris that's great so what we'll do is we'll finish now so big thank you to if, any, if anyone has any specific questions that are related more to the doctor side of it very happy to take questions they just email me at lorenzo at sportdoctorlondon.com uh, they can email me if they want to discuss you know, their, their own pathways, their experiences, what they should do. Very happy to answer those questions. Right. What we'll do is we'll put your emails in our follow up email, which we'll send out tomorrow. We'll put Perfect. that in, in and with your slides as well. So, um, yeah, big thank you. Thank you very much for all the prep work and for presenting for us tonight, guys. It's been really interesting. Cool. Thank you, Andy. Thanks well, for thank having you. us. And thanks for, yeah, thanks for supporting the, the, you know, getting it out to people because that's really yeah, important no for people to get the right information. No, no, it's great. Thank you very much for everyone joining us and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.